Welcome to the exam one review. Obviously, my name is Rebecca. I think I just have my students. I don't see any of Dr. Bogart's students here. Um, people might be joining us, uh, so that's fine. Um, so we have um, Yesenia, Yesenia, Helene, Reese, and um, Dwayne. So um, Helene, go ahead and tell me what questions you had after you looked over the review information. Okay. Um, so I know, I I know that um, we're breaking down the stages of mm -hmm. Freud, Piaget, um, and then Erickson. Erickson. Is the, yeah. Um, and then on the last part, I, I guess I got confused on Kohlberg stages of moral development. Okay. So, I guess I'm like all over the place, so I apologize. <laughs> No, I'm no, that's fine. Yeah. Figure out maybe how to do it in a format manner. Okay. Um, because I look at the review and I'm like, oh my gosh. And I also had a question regarding the the techniques to cope with a lethargic infant. Mm-hmm. So lethargic infant, we talked about it briefly. That's that's the term that they use for an overstimulated infant. So lethargic can be, you know, a sign of illness. But in this case, when they're referring to a lethargic infant, they're not referring to an infant that's sick or has some sort of a medical problem. It's a it's an infant that's overstimulated. So now oh, that now that I'm okay. saying that, um, I want you to think about like what do you think you would do if an infant okay. was overstimulated? So okay, that's like the calm voice you know, minimal like lights, you know, babies are kind of freaked out by a lot of lights and noises and stuff like that, moving them slowly from one position to another. So the lethargic in this case refers to an infant that is so okay. overstimulated that the baby kind of shuts down and they kind of have this oh. blank stare. All right. Because so I'm, I'm thinking, I'm thinking lethargic, like they're not with it now. Why, why would we keep the, oh, okay. you know, you know what I mean? I'm thinking mm -hmm. the opposite. So, right. And we actually reviewed this with one of our professors in class. So that's okay. why I wanted to um, ask you. So yeah. it's actually an overstimulated. Right. Child. So like okay. the, it's an infant that is become lethargic because okay. of overstimulation. So then okay. the appropriate response is to kind of decrease the stimulation. Whereas okay. you could have an infant that had like a serious infection and was lethargic and that those things would not you know, you would be getting addressing the medical needs of the infant in that case. But in this specific in, in instance, they're referring to an infant that became kind of out of it and and blank stare, not really reacting because of overstimulation. Okay, thank you. Okay, sure. Um, does anyone else have any questions before we get started over the basic review of the material? No. Okay. No. Okay. Did all of you uh, look at the worksheet? Because there was like a worksheet and then there was a PowerPoint presentation. Does everyone have the the worksheet or not? Yes. Yes. Okay. I, I, I want to add one more question. Oh, yeah. Professor. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, no. It's your time. Tell me, tell this me is probably because my age, but what is a, a sling carrier? That's like the thing that you see moms wearing where they put the baby in like a big cloth that wraps around their body. Oh, and okay. Like a knot in the back. Yeah. yeah, so that's showing my age. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I bet Reese knows what it is. Okay, probably. I actually used to wear my babies. So okay. it's like, like it's a long, stretchy fabric and you like okay. wrap it and tie it and tuck the baby into it. Gotcha. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Do you have any more questions, Reese? Oh, I'm sorry, um, Helene? No, not yet. Thank you. <laughs> okay. All right. No, no. So um, once we start the PowerPoint, I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my screen. But I think the, the first part here that has on that study guide that has the fill in the blanks, um, I think that was really useful because I know all of these terms are going to be on this test. So if you could pull that one out and we'll go over it together. So the first one, it says a term for toddlers increasing their sense of security by making compulsive routines of simple tasks. Did you guys assign a word to that? Did you guys do this? Yeah. So I think you're on meet, mute, Reese. What did you put in there for that? Ritualism. Ritualism. Very good. Um, and then the next one proceeds from midline to periphery. What is that? What type of development is that? 
proximal distal. That's proximal distal. Um, and then refers to the ability um, to perform general physical functions. General to specific. General to specific. And that one was, I had to do like a process of elimination and be like, okay, that one makes sense. Um, but that's the, you know, that's a, a normal way um, that we develop. Um, and then is the total way in which a person grows and develops as dictated by inheritance? Maturation. That is maturation. So you will see, you will likely see some tricky questions where you have to really be able to pinpoint the definition of maturation versus heredity. So what is, it's not on here, but what, what would you say heredity is? Like your DNA. Mm -hmm. So it's, it is your DNA and it's a factor that develops maturation. So you mature, um, um, you know, as dictated by your heredity. But so you will need to, I would focus on those two because in the past there have been very specific test questions where you have to be able to like pinpoint the definition of heredity versus maturation. Helene, you're looking, you're looking confused, Helene. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm good so far. Okay. Okay. I got that. Okay. All right. Um, and then uh, children play next to each other, but not with each other. What type of play is that? Parallel. That's parallel. And I skipped ahead. I'm sorry. So it refers to an increase in physical size. Growth. That's growth. Um, and then development from head to toe. Cephalocaudal. That's cephalocaudal. And this is the where they have heredity as a factor that develops maturation. And heredity is also your genetic predisposition and your DNA. Um, the next one includes Includes grandparents, parents, children, and relatives. What type of family is that? That's your extended, extended family. Extended. And um, refers to remarried individuals with children. What type of family is that? Blended. Blended. And refers to communal families or, you know, families that include friends and other people. Alternative. That's alternative. And this one is defined as the unique organization of characteristics that determine the individual's typical or recurrent pattern of behavior. What is that? Personality. That's your personality. And the traditional family, husband, wife, and children? Nuclear. Nuclear. And refers to the protrusion of the tongue to prevent intake of inappropriate food? Extrusion. Reflux. Yep. That's when a baby kind of spits Reflex. It out. I'm sorry. Yep. Mm-hmm. And then occurs when you touch the palm of the infant and flexion occurs. Grasp reflex. That's your grasp reflex. This one was a little bit tricky. Is the ability to grasp objects between fingers and opposing thumb? Prehension? Prehension. So, right. So it's also the pincer grasp. But prehension in general is the ability to grasp things and move them for you. So prehension includes the ability to grasp objects between your fingers and opposing thumb because when you have prehension, you, you, you intentionally grab something and bring it towards yourself. Whereas the grasp reflex, you're, you're just intuitively um, grasping around the finger, but it's not like an intentional movement to move something for, towards yourself. So, um, but also grasping something between your fingers and opposing them, that's the pincer grasp. Pincer grasp. And that's kind of how you like hold a crayon or something when you're learning to write. Um, and a protective arm extension that occurs when an infant is suddenly thrust downward. So you're holding them and you flip them over. Parachute reflex. Yeah. And that is one that is like um, also like to, you know, it's like a reflex to protect you from being harmed, right? Because you're going to put your, your, your arms out and your legs out to protect your body. Um, and then an example of toddler testing their power and control or independence by saying no frequently. Negativism. That's negativism. Um, refers to a progressive increase in the body's function. Development. That's development. Um, and then a type of thinking that doesn't recognize any point of view other than the child's own. Ecocentrism. 
ecocentrism. And then the last one about toddlers is actually the first one on the shirt sheet. It's a term for toddlers increasing their sense of security by making compulsive routines of simple tasks. Ritualism? That's ritualism. So there's a lot of terms on this worksheet um, that are related to toddlers. It's kind of a complicated age, right? <laughs> so I would I would recognize all of those terms. Um, I'm going to go ahead and put this PowerPoint up now and start sharing my screen. Okay, so this first slide here is the terms that we just went over. So I think that worksheet does a really good job of, you know, if you can try to match the terms, I, to be honest with you, they're a little bit hard. Sometimes the columns don't match up perfectly on the bottom of the sheet, but all of the terms are on there. So if you could study the terms and then match them on the worksheet, that's a really good way to help you kind of remember those terms. You do almost all of them. I think between the, the four of you that you knew all of them, but I would certainly know all of the terms that are on this first slide of the PowerPoint presentation, um, because there will be test questions on all of these terms. And that's what we just went over on that worksheet. And so, um, as Helene said, there are, there are several different stages. Um, the first one in this presentation is Freud. Um, and I think the first one, it makes the most sense to me. So the, the first stage is the oral stage. This is your infancy. And I think, you know, think of any infant that, you know, they, they really like to have things in their mouth. They get a lot of pleasure from oral activities. So whether it's eating or sucking on a pacifier, um, they are exploring their world through their, um, their senses and, and particularly their mouth. And then the anal stage is your toddler years. And I think that makes sense because we all know that babies or toddlers are, are learning to 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 uh, toilet train during this period. So, you know, anal, anus, poop, toilet training. Um, and then the phallic stage is that preschool year, um, the three to six year olds. And this is where boys are really attached to their mother and girls are really attached to their father. And then the school age is the latency, and this is where they tend to spend time in their same-sex peers. And I don't know if you've ever been to a schoolyard and seen kids playing, but like all the eight-year-old boys are playing with eight-year-old boys, and all the eight-year-old girls are playing with girls. They kind of separate into their own gender. And then the genital stage, that's puberty and beyond, when they're they're really talking or you know they're opposed and according to freud they're op the opposite sex but we would just generally say now i mean that's freud's theory but we would say you know sexually attracted to other people um and some key things to sort of remember um so the the phallic stage this is where they start being aware of gender because before that they're not really even necessarily conscious of the fact that there are differences between boys and girls. Um, and that's that preschool years where the boys are really attached to the mother and the girls are attached to the father. And the latency stage, um, that's where they are aware of gender, but they, they tend to spend time with their own gender group. Do you guys have any questions about that? On this next little slide, I'm going to ask you to give me some, some examples. So um, infants exploring the world through their mouth, what, do you, what would you say about that? What's an example of how an infant does that? Like using you a think? binky maybe or something? Yeah, and also exploring the world through the mouth. They like to their taste fingers. Things. Yeah, they're putting their fingers in their mouth. The they, they're licking things or they... Mm -hmm. they they're just, they're, you know, so they're, they're getting a lot of information about their environment. So, and for Piaget, this is called sensory motor. So Freud calls it oral, Piaget calls it sensory motor, but they're learning a lot about the environment by putting things in their mouth. Um, and then the analogy stage, that one, you know, that's toilet training saying no. Um, and then, yeah, I think the, you know, if you understood the, the third slide, then this next slide, slide number four, should make sense to you because there's nothing, it's just kind of repeating the same information. Um, I think it's good when you when you think about stages to try to think, of, okay, so Freud says stage one is orality and then Piaget says it's sensory motor because they, they, they kind of match up, but like 
you know, Freud is about sexual development and Piaget is about cognitive, but you're going to see some similarities based on their age. So um, the first one for Piaget, sensory motor, oral for um, Freud, this is them like really exploring the world from their environment. And then pre-operational, which, um, what can you guys tell me about pre-operational? What really develops during this sort of preschool years? What is their main cognitive thing that they develop as a preschooler? I see Helene looking at her notes. No way. Huh? So think of a, a like a three or four year old. What's really changing? What's different about a, a three year old versus a two year old? They talk so much better. They talk so much better. So this is one of the main things with the pre-operational phase is this like very um, rapid development of language where they start using grammar um, and they're really able to express themselves. So that's kind of the earlier like earlier because pre-operational in five years is what happens in that five year. And then the later, you know, they're starting to get into this imagination. So if you've ever been around like a five or a six year old, they often have imaginary friends. So they, they really have all of these imaginary thoughts. And we talked about some things like animism. Who can, who remembers what animism means? It's something that you see in the pre-operational phase. So when they like yell at objects or like talk to objects? So animism is when they, they think that non-human objects have human characteristics. So they, they, they give animation to objects that are not human. So their teddy bear talks to them or, or they believe that um, the wind is blowing because someone's mad and they're blowing out hot air. So they, they see things in their environment and they give them human characteristics even though they, those things are not human. And that's part of that imaginative thinking stage of their development. And we talked about another one in this stage is they're, they're imaginative and they're intuitive. So who can give me an example of like an intuitive way of thinking for a, a preschool child? So for example, if you have a quarter that's bigger than a dime and you're thinking intuitively, which one do you think is gonna be, wait a second, I gotta say it differently. You have a nickel, that's bigger than a dime. So a nickel is five cents and a dime is 10 cents, but the nickel is bigger. So if you have an intuitive thought process, which one are you going to think is bigger? The, which coin? Is the nickel. The nickel you will intuitively think is worth more because it's bigger. So you don't really understand that you can assign value to something, you know, other than based on its size, right? You, you see something, you think the bigger one is worth more and that's intuitive. And then when you get into the concrete operations, this is where you start to have more math skills. This is your school age child. They're very, very logical and concrete. That's why it's called concrete operations. Um, and then the last stage is your formal operations when then you can like think abstractly, you have more advanced math skills. So when I look at Piget, I kind of like, Remember the first one, sensory motor, and that's like they're they're touching everything, they're exploring their environment by touch and taste. And then formal operations, that's like advanced thought. And then I kind of put pre-operational and concrete operational. I remember those two. That's how I think about it. I think of the 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 two, the top and the bottom, and then I think about the middle. Because you you will be asked you know, a teenager that has abstract thinking, that is an example of what, and that's going to be your formal operations. So you will be asked, um, you know, to identify the stage based on the description of the stage. Does that make sense? Um, and for me, um, you know, remember that formal operations is associated with abstract. Concrete is associated with development of math skills, pre-operational, this is language, imagination, and sensory motor is, you know, exploring the world by touch and taste. So these, this one here kind of gives you some, some examples or asks for examples and gives some examples. So sensory motor, we talked about exploring the world through your mouth. 
pre-operational. Uh, this is the, you know, imaginative thinking, animism, and intuition. Concrete is the logical thinking, starting to really understand math and asking questions like, why did I get sick? Why did my dog die? Just this is that why, why, why stage for those of you that are parents. And the former operations is when they're kind of more adult and they're having more abstract thoughts. So Erickson, um, this, this goes over, you know, each stage from infancy through, through older adulthood. Obviously, you know, we're only going through um, adolescence here, so you don't have to, you know, remember the later stages. Um, does anyone have like a trick or a way that they have been studying this that has helped them remember the different stages? What have you been doing, um, Helene, to study this? You're on mute. I still can't hear you. I might unmute you here. <laughs> oh, sorry. That's uh, okay. I just started doing the definitions and um, trying to distinguish between Erickson, Paget, like mm. just their backgrounds right now, because I'm okay. still trying to figure out how I'm going to remember. Okay, so <laughs> Paget is going to be cognitive or how they think, and Erickson is psychosocial, so they each kind of have their own uh, emphasis, right, even though they go through the same age groups. So Freud is sexual, Piget is cognitive, and then Erickson is psychosocial slash personality development. <clears throat> so, and I think, you know, the first one, trust versus mistrust, I think that makes sense to all of us. Like babies, you know, need to have a consistent caregiver to develop that sense of trust. And if they don't, then they're, they don't have a sense of trust and that really negatively impacts their personality development. So to remember that like, who you are, like your personality characteristics that develop over time, it has a lot to do with your, your caregiver relationship as an infant. So if they don't have a good consistent caregiver and they don't develop that sense of trust, then they are likely to have problems with personality development over time. And then autonomy versus shame and doubt, you know, this is your toddler that's like, me do it, me do it, I do it, me, me, me. They're very egocentric. They only see the world from their perspective. So you want them in each stage, you want them to develop the first characteristic. So as an infant, you want them to develop a sense of trust. As a toddler, you want them to develop a sense of autonomy. Um, and then when you move into the preschool, that's initiative versus guilt. So you want them to have a sense of initiative. So you want them to take initiative and want to try new things. And then industry versus inferiority, this is gonna be your, your school age, you want them to feel like they are able to do things and to not feel inferior. And then their adolescence is their identity versus confusion. You want them to have a sense of identity and not to feel confused. So for every stage for Eric said, he gives you two opposing factors and you and the, the ideal is that they develop the first one and the, the negative is the second. So there's always two opposing and the ideal situation is they develop the first one. Does anyone have any questions about that? So what do you think you're going to do? So as an infant, you're going to be a consistent caregiver, meet their needs, respond to the baby when the baby cries. What do you do for the toddler years? How do you develop a sense of autonomy in a toddler? Encourage independence. Yes. And how do you encourage independence? Let them do things on their own. Okay. Uh, so you have 10 times yeah. longer. <laughs> Right, right. So this is like if you have a toddler and they're able to put on their shoes, it might take them 20 minutes, but you're going to give them that 20 minutes to put on their shoes and then they're going to feel like they have a sense of autonomy that they can do it. So this is like, you know, allowing them to have that autonomy. So giving them tasks that they can complete that are age appropriate. Um, and then not doing things for them. If you're constantly doing things for them, then they're going to develop that sense of shame and doubt. And then how about the initiative versus guilt? 
what do you do to help a, a preschool child develop a sense of initiative? So Reese, I think you have preschool kids. Yeah, uh, I don't, I don't know, because I don't know how I did it. My kids are just awesome. <laughs> they just do things, <laughs> and there's like, okay. Uh, so this is also thinking about like um, what is developmentally appropriate. So like, if you have a, a four year old. Um, they might be able to put beads on a string, but they're not going to be able to crochet. So you're going to give them tasks that they can complete. And then they're going to be like, oh, I did that. And you give them positive reinforcement. Good, good job putting beads on the string. Um, and over time, if you're exposing them to new tasks and they're developing a sense of accomplishment, then they're going to develop a sense of initiative. So it kind of, it feeds off that develop autonomy in a toddler. You let them do things. And then as you get into the preschool years, you expose them to things that they're going to be able to do so that they get a sense of accomplishment and then they develop a sense of initiative. And that's kind of leads to the industry versus inferiority. You know, um, you want them to develop a sense of industry, so you encourage them to do things that they're good at. This is kind of the age where they're going to maybe get into sports, but maybe they're going to be more into music. So that's okay, but you want them to do things that they like and that they enjoy, because um, then they'll develop that sense of industry. But, you know, they're, they're still young, so you want to expose them to multiple things and then let them choose the things that they're good at. Does that make sense? And then the, the teenage years, this is identity versus confusion. This is where their peer groups are like the most important thing in their life. And you just have to recognize that that's why is that they're, they're working through that, building that sense of identity. So um, I'm going to make this smaller so you can see this. Um, this kind of goes through the, the same thing that we just talked about. It's just a re revision of the, the previous slide. Um, but it gives some specific examples. So uh, Reese gave the example of letting the toddler put on their shoes, also letting them eat, letting them pick out their clothes, trying to get them to express their needs. All of those things help the toddler develop that sense of autonomy. Um, and then preschool, this is like, you know, doing tasks that they're able to complete in the school age. Um, this is where they just start to develop teamwork. This is probably the first time when they're going to be on sports teams. Um, so kind of thinking about where they are in their psychosocial development and then putting them in, in situations where they're going to develop the skills that are age appropriate. And this one here, you guys have probably seen this over and over again. This is Maslow. So, um, you know, at the very, very top of this pyramid, you have your self-esteem needs. And at the very, very bottom, these are your physiological needs. So you have to have your physiological needs met before you're worried about safety, before you're worried about love and belonging. So you kind of build build this triangle where the, the base of the triangle is your physical needs being met. And this is kind of discussed throughout nursing school. So I don't think this is the first time you've seen Maslow. No, I think the study guide has it um, mixed up, though. Oh, what does the study guide say? It has safety needs first and then oh, physiological no. needs. Yeah, and, I yeah. mean, we know that that's wrong, but. Yeah, thank you for pointing that out and I can fix it for next term. You're right. So it's the physiological needs before safety needs. Thank you, Reese. Yep. And this is the, Kohlberg is the one that I think that students struggle with the most. Um, so is anyone that's here today want to want to summarize Kohlberg for the rest of the students? What do you think? So I my, da my daughter comes down the steps and she's like, oh, yeah, I know all that. She's like in the in the back room going, oh, yeah, I know uh, Freud and we know all that. And I'm like, well, I wish you could teach me. <laughs> <laughs> Those smart she's ass like rabble, kids. rabbling them off. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so what do you think, Reese? How would, how would you summarize Kohlberg? So the first level, uh, obedience and punishment, like they're doing, they don't know anything. They don't know about right and wrong. They just don't want to get in trouble. Mm -hmm. they, um, and then self-interest, um, they, they want to get rewarded for be behaving. So, mm -hmm. so they're thinking about their, their, 
their own self, that, right? Yeah, yeah. They, they because they, at that point they're very egocentric, so they're like, oh, you know, if I'm good, I, I get a mm-hmm. reward. This is great. Um, and then I think of like my six year old just wants everybody to like her, so like that's the the good boy girl level. Like th- mm-hmm. she just wants everyone to. She just wants to conform so she fits in with everyone. Mm-hmm. Um, and I also think for this school age, this is also for Piget, this is the concrete operations where they're very concrete in their thinking, right? There's a right and a wrong way to do things. There's It's good or it's bad. So, and they, they very, they're kind of focused on fixed rules. And that kind of goes along with their cognitive development also, because they're very concrete at that stage. Yeah. And then as they move into their teenage years, what happens? Uh, well, by then, we hope and pray that they've actually learned the difference between right and wrong. And they know what they're supposed to do and what they're not allowed to do. Thanks to their formal operational. This is, yeah, thinking. this is formal operations abstract thinking. So the one thing I can say about Colbert is that, um, you know, the earlier stages don't go away. Like just because you are concerned with self-interest as a preschool child, you also don't want to get in trouble. So it's like layers are added instead of something replacing something else. So, you know, as you're going through your moral development, there's still going to be the sense of, well, I don't want to get in trouble. So I'm not going to do something because I don't want to get in trouble. And I want people to like me and I'm worried about my self-interest, but it's more like it builds on itself instead of one replacing the other. Okay. Um, so this one, you know, on the worksheet, she kind of developed this, the worksheet was developed by a different PEDS instructor, but I, I adopted it for you guys. So um, there's certain things that you need to think about specifically for infants. And one of them is just knowing terms. So a neonate is birth until four weeks and an infant is four weeks to one year. So you might see that on a test where you're gonna have to define, you know, a neonate versus an infant. Um, and we've talked about some very specific things. So you definitely need to remember, for example, that a baby's weight should double by six months. So if they say, you know, the baby was seven pounds, six ounces at birth, what do you expect the baby's weight to be at six months? And you're going to have to know to double that. And then it triples by the first year. Um, usually we test weight questions more than height, but generally speaking, they should increase by one inch in the first six months on an infant on average is 29 inches by one year. Um, And you should know big milestones. So um, infants should take some independent steps by one year. They should have teeth around six months. Uh, When do infants normally start rolling over? Is it three months? About four months, yeah. Um, and when do they start sitting up independently? You're not touching them. They're just sitting there on their own without any support for several seconds or minutes. Six months? So maybe, but certainly by eight months. So, you know, many of you might have some advanced kids, but I would sort of go through <laughs> and, and, and be able to pinpoint. So certainly if you're 10 months old and you're not sitting up, that's a problem. Um, or if you're a year and you're not taking independent steps or standing on your feet, that's a problem. So it's kind of, you need to know, like, at this age, they definitely should be doing this because kids, you know, not every kid is exactly the same and they're going to kind of, um, you know, might start something slower or later, but by specific endpoints, they should definitely be doing something. And if they're not, then you need to be worried that there's something wrong. Um, and then in terms of the food, we talked about this. So breast milk is best. And if it's not breast milk, what, you know, it's formula. And um, when do you start introducing solid foods to babies? Five, six months. Yes. And uh, what is the first food that you introduce? Rice. Rice cereal. And cereal. why? Small bowl. Huh? more bulk they'll feel full Small bulk so the reason no why chance you choose, of allergic reactions yeah it's it's the most hypoallergenic so you're very unlikely to have you know almost no one is allergic to rice 
So um, you start with rice cereal because it, you know it's you know they they are very unlikely to have an allergic reaction. And then how often do yeah. you introduce so new funny. foods? Um, and this is also because of allergies. Yeah. So every four to seven days. Yeah, so four to seven days um, and that's so you know if they have an allergic reaction or some sort of a adverse reaction you can pinpoint which food it was um and then if you make baby food at home what are some things to to remember if you're going to make your own food instead of buying the cans don't season it <clears throat> yeah specifically don't do any salt or sugar and you should never give honey before the age of year and that's because of the risk of botulism um and then make sure you know it's the right temperature and there's a there's a a quick way to remember like a, a, a feeding size. So it's like a tablespoon per year in age. So like a one-year-old might do like a tablespoon of something. Um, and then the infant continued. Um, you got to know about car seats. I think you guys all know this. So rear facing um, until they're at least 22 pounds, center secured. Um, and this is this slide has a lethargic infant that Helene asked about. I think we went over everything on this. Oh, except the SIDS. So what can you guys tell me about SIDS? Set of infant death syndrome. Okay. Uh, they should be and, lying, sleeping on their backs on a firm mattress. Right. No blankets, so no, no pillows, no blankets, nothing in the yep. crib. Yep, yep, very good. Um, and then the toddler. Uh, this is, you know, the potty training years. Um, you should remember that their weight should quadruple. So it doubles by six months, triples by one year and quadruples by 2.5 years. So you should definitely know those things. So if you're ever given the birth weight, you can predict their weight at certain ages. Um, we talked about they're really a lot more, you know, they acquire a lot of language. <laughs> they're also, you know, motor skills are really increasing. Their digestive system is increasing. So, you know, babies eat all the time. And then by the time you're a toddler, you're going to be able to maybe move towards, you know, more consistent meals like the family. Um, and then you should be able to recognize what Erickson says and what Piaget says about this age group. Um, you know, the main thing, potty training, developing a sense of autonomy. Um, and then you're going to, you know, what do you, what do you, what sorts of anticipatory guidance do you do um, when they have temper tantrums or they're saying no all the time? What do you, what do you say to parents to help them through that stage? You just got to stay calm. Okay. Each rather uh, than punish. Okay. And so if the kid, like if you're at Target and the kid is absolutely losing his mind and screaming and you're embarrassed, how do you respond? I don't know. I don't get embarrassed. Okay. I don't either. <laughs> I, don't either. So I just sit down thing, with them. I just okay. wait for it to pass. I'm just like, at well, some point you're going to give up. Yeah. And that is the main thing is that you don't, you know, you don't reward that type of behavior. So if they want a toy and they are like losing their mind because you won't give them the toy that they want, you don't give them the toy, right? So they're going to be testing your boundaries um, and, and they could scream and cry and kick and they might really, really lose their mind, but you just kind of let them do that. And then when they're done, you just pick them up and you leave or have them walk with you. Um, but you, the main thing is, is that you don't sort of encourage that sort of behavior by giving in. So that's the same thing at like at bedtime, you know, I'm thirsty, I'm hungry, I need a snack, I need to go to the bathroom. So you do all those things. You're like, okay, it's time to go to bed. And then if they want something, you're like, no, it's time to go to bed. So you have like very specific rules and you don't go into this sort of attention seeking behavior. Um, so the preschool, um, you know, obviously they're getting ready to enter school. Um, and so this is where, you know, if they have the option to go to a preschool, we recommend it. Um, they, they learn a lot about following rules and stuff like that. Um, this is where they're really imaginative. Erickson is where they're, you know, what they want them to develop that sense of initiative. Um, they're still developing their language. Um, 
And then in terms of uh, thumb sucking and masturbation, these are two things that parents might ask about. How do you respond, you know, as, as the pediatric nurse, if you have a, a parent that is worried that their four-year-old is still sucking their thumb? Um, as long as it's not affecting, like, them playing, like, if that's all they're doing, then mm -hmm. it's a, like, a problem. But if it's just, like, it's a comfort thing. So eventually they'll grow out of it. They're not going yeah, to go so, to college sucking their thumbs. So Yeah. Yeah. The main thing is you try not to make a big deal out of it. Right. You don't want to, you know, you don't want to put hot sauce on their thumb. You don't want to punish them. Try to, you can try to do some positive reinforcement, but not negative. Um, and then, you know, as long as they're not sucking their thumb by the time their permanent teeth are coming in, which is around age six, it's not a problem. So you, the general, the general rule of thumb is you don't make a big deal out of it. And how about masturbation? Is masturbation common? Do kids do that? Yes, they do. Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah, it's one of those things also that it will happen. So it's the same thing. You don't want to shame the kid. You don't want them to feel shameful or, or have a low sense of self-worth. So it's like, this is something you do in private, you know, and just kind of put boundaries on it, but recognize that they're going to be exploring their body and it's probably going to happen. Um, and then how about enuresis? This was the second week. Can someone just give me a general definition of what enuresis is? Bedwetting. Bedwetting. And there's primary and secondary. And what's the difference between primary and secondary? Primary is a um, child who has never been dry. And secondary is um, they've been dry for a period of one year or more. And then, so what do you, what, what might be some causes? Like you've had a kid who's been dry, so they, they develop secondary enuresis. Why might that happen? So there's some physiological reasons, like what sort of infection might cause you to have secondary enuresis? UTI. UTI. Um, how about like metabolic conditions like, you know, uh, diabetes, diabetes, diabetes mellitus and diabetes insipidus. Um, and there could be like a psychological, it could be a regressive behavior, like something stressful is happening. And then now they're starting to wet their bed at night. Um, so what, what can you do as a nurse or what do you need to do as a nurse? How do you address it? Put them on a bathroom schedule. Mm -hmm. So one of the first things you do is you get more data, right? You figure out what's going on. When did it start? Um, how often does it happen, et cetera? You get all the information. What does the urine look like? What does the urine smell like? Did something precipitate it that caused them to happen? And then once you figure out, let's say that it's, it, you don't think it's related to diabetes or an infection, there's like not a physiological problem, then you're going to start thinking about behavioral things like putting them on a schedule, um, not letting them drink a lot of liquid right before they go to bed. So, you know, there are, there's bladder training and there's like therapy that kids can go to. But before you get to that point, you first have to rule out there's something physiologically wrong with them that's causing them to wet their bed. Um, and then we talked about the school age kids. Um, you know, this is their, they're in Erickson stage of industry versus inferiority. So the thing that you don't want them to develop is a sense of inferiority. So you want them to develop the sense that they're able to do things, that they can accomplish things. Um, this is when they might be playing sports or maybe playing their first musical instrument. Their growth starts to slow down, so they kind of slow down, and then when they hit puberty, they they grow quickly again. Um, and so, you know, for each stage, you should be able to identify the theorists for that stage. So, you know, Erickson, this is industry versus inferiority. What what stage would this be for um, Freud? Is this latency or phallic? You remember? So this would be latency. So this is when they're like playing with their same sex peers, et cetera. They're kind of moving into separate groups. So for each stage, I would kind of try to 
be like, okay, so school age, this is Erickson, this is Freud, this is Piaget. So the school age is going to be concrete. It's going to be for Erickson, it's going to be industry versus inferiority. For Freud, it's going to be latency. So be able to identify each stage based on their, um, or each theorist per age group. And then adolescence, you're going to be doing your, um, you know, this is where they develop their sense of independency. This is when they start developing their abstract thinking, et cetera. So always, always when you're doing um, education as a nurse, you should be using the nurse's pro nursing process. So assessing first, then planning, implementing, and then evaluating your implementation. Um, you should remember that the Denver 2 is not an intelligence test. It's just a test to identify red flags, but, you know, parents shouldn't be stressed out about it. It doesn't determine whether or not their child is intelligent or not. And in terms of timeouts, you should remember that it's one minute per age and year. So a five-year-old should get five minutes of timeouts. Body surface area is the most accurate method for calculating uh, drug dosages for children. Um, and then in terms of sex education for adolescents, this is really, you know, having those open lines of communication, getting them to talk to you um, and not, um, not judging them, not encouraging them to get information off the internet or um, other unreliable sources. Um, so I would definitely, you know, the last week we talked about medications why they are, uh, children are at higher risk for toxicity than adults. You should definitely remember, you know, where you give IM injections. So the IM injection site um, for toddlers and children is going to be the vastus lateralis. Um, adolescents, you can do the ventral gluteal if it's a really big medication, um, or you can also do the deltoid. Um, if they have an IV, you got to make sure that you're evaluating their IV site every hour. Um, and you do need to remember that one gram is one milliliter. So if you're doing input and output for a baby, you're going to weigh their dry diaper and subtract that from the wet diaper weight. Um, and this is just um, a quick review, you know, remembering that you are going to have dosage calculations on the test. Um, and two quick things. Who can tell me what they think the leading cause of death is in children? What do you think? Motor accidents. Accident. Yeah, motor vehicle accidents. Um, and then we talked about latchkey children. Who who can tell me what the definition of a latchkey child is? Kids that are left to home, home alone. Mm -hmm. And they're at risk for accidents, etc. Um, and then on that sheet, it does it does mention tetracycline. So do you, does anyone know why you don't recommend tetracycline to children under the age of eight? Turns their teeth gray. It stains their teeth. So it can stain their permanent teeth. Yep. So that is the review. Um, do you guys have any questions? Okay. If you have any questions, I'll be checking my emails throughout the, you know, the weekend. Um, please download the test before you come to class. Um, and then we'll do it, you know, on Zoom. I'll check your ID. Um, they have been encouraging students to have a whiteboard for their dosage calculations. For sure, when you have your HESI, if you don't have a whiteboard, you won't be able to write anything down. So I strongly encourage you to get a whiteboard before your first exam. Okay? All righty. So if you don't have any questions, then I'll let you go. Thank you. Have a good Thank day. You. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.